Hey everybody, it's Professor Parrish, and we are at week 12 of English 122. So we are um, getting closer to wrapping up drama. We're going to spend this week and then next week with drama um, before we move on to our final paper. So you still have the entire week 12 and week 13 to write your papers. So no worries. <laughs> um, you will have time to get your papers done if you're worried about that. Um, and then obviously we're going to have time. The last month basically of class is going to be pushing to finish up our research paper and we'll talk about that as we get closer. So what we're going to do this week is we are going to actually finish up talking about the terminology for drama. So this will be our last discussion about drama specifically, terminology wise, um, and then I'm going to go over the assignments. I am posting this on Sunday of week 11, so if you have not watched the week 11 video, make sure you watch that. And um, if you've not turned in your assignments for week 11, make sure that you've done that as well. But we really only have two assignments this week, so let's uh, get to talking about them first. I'm going to minimize myself over here. I'm up here in the corner now. Hey and uh, we're going to go over here to course content and check out week 12. So like I said, week 11 is still up. Your outline, the reading response, and your discussion form. Make sure you have those done by tonight, Sunday night. Um, for this week, we're going to be looking at the American drama chapter, and we're going to go ahead and talk about the comedy chapter, even though it's not listed in your readings here. Um, we are going to talk about that. If you've not looked at evaluating sources in your Cengage handbook, it's only seven pages. Make sure to check that out because it's probably going to tie in with this assignment we're doing this week. So you only have two assignments, um, which we're going to bring up and talk about here. The optional assignment for this coming week is revising paper two. If you would like to revise your poetry paper, those revisions are due by Sunday at 11.55. So it's not Monday, like paper one, since we had a holiday. It's not Monday. Um, these are going to be Sunday is when these are due. So make sure if you are planning to revise, um, just put paper two revisions. You can put English 122, 122.02, whichever section you're in, and just make sure to attach your revisions there. Now these are optional. If you got a good grade on paper two, you do not have to revise. All right, so let's talk about uh, the discussion forum first. The discussion forum for week 12 uh, is basically looking at the play Death of a Salesman um, in chapter 29, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit in the PowerPoint. So I know some of you have chosen to actually write about Death of a Salesman for your paper number three, which will make this assignment very easy for you because you will definitely understand the answers to this question. So it's asking what sets Death of a Salesman apart from Greek tragedies and Shakespearean plays? Are there any similarities? I'm going to give you a short answer. Yes, there are similarities to Greek plays as well as Shakespeare with Death of a Salesman, even though it's technically described as an American drama. There's some similarities. So um, I'm, I'm in, interested to see what you put down there. American drama in question two marks a distinct turn from what used to be captured in Greek and Shakespearean plays. What is this turn? And we're going to talk about that in this video today. So if you're not sure what that means, don't worry. If you watch this video, you're going to know the answer to number two by the end of this uh, lecture video today. And then finally, what is Willie Loman's struggle in the play? How can people relate to a struggle? What's the overall theme? So it's a little bit complex with the death of a salesman, but there is a distinct theme and struggle that Willie has, and we'll talk a little bit about it in this video, but if you read the play, you're definitely going to understand that as well. Your posts are due by Friday night, and then replies are due by Sunday. So I know a lot of you probably have Halloween plans, things like that. I would encourage you to check out this play early on in the week so you can get your post up, um, so that way you're not having to do it Friday night, and then hopefully if enough people do that, then we will have uh, enough posts that everybody can just go ahead and finish up their discussion forum by the weekend because I want you to enjoy your weekend, right? So that is our discussion forum. That's one of our assignments for week 12. The other assignment, I told you all we were going to start doing more with MLA, and that we are. We finished up our reading responses 
uh, this last week in week 11. If you've not done your reading response, make sure to do it. Um, so we have no more reading responses for the rest of class. Instead, what we're going to start doing is a bit more with MLA and MLA reviews. So a lot of students in this class so far have kind of gotten out of not having to do MLA. <laughs> either you wrote, um, either you didn't use photos you had to cite, you used your own, or you just used the textbook, or you just didn't cite the textbook, <laughs> or you, in paper one, you just wrote a story so you didn't have to cite anything. Um, some of you have gotten away with not using a lot of MLA citations so far in the class. Um, that is not going to be the case with your final paper. So I usually start to get very much MLA heavy in the second half of the semester because I want to make sure that you know how to cite properly, that you know how to cite your sources, use in-text citations, and to make sure that you have watched the MLA citation video. So I posted an MLA citation video along with this presentation way back in week five. So that, that's been over a month ago. So if you've not watched that video, or if you watched it and you forgot it, I would encourage you to go back, watch that MLA citation presentation video. It's about half an hour. Go back and watch it, and it will help you in the next assignments that we do in this class. But um, that being said, the other assignment due this week is our MLA review. So if you go in the Dropbox, there's this MLA review link. Go ahead and click on it and I'm going to pull it up here to show you all. So what I would like for you to do is, um, as you can see here, you have like a number one here, I've listed pieces of information that you would normally find on a works cited page. What I want you to do is press enter twice. Uh, let me enable editing, so it'll let me do that. So go down below number one here, and what I want you to do is when you get to where you when you get to where the little line is over here on the side, I want you to type out the order these should all be in. Now note in the directions for parts that would be italicized, you can underline them if you handwrite the answers. But note this is an online class. I use this assignment for both face-to-face -face and online classes. Since we are online, you don't underline. You are going to italicize the parts that need italicizing. So for example. What do we italicize with a book? We italicize its title. So when you write out your citation here, or when you type it out here, make sure that the title, The Art of Duck Hunting in this case, is italicized. I will take off if it is not. So please note that. Um, I want these citations to be in the correct order, and I want the formatting to be correct as well. So again, if you go back to the MLA citation presentation and the video, I explain how to cite, I basically explain how to cite each of these sources that are here. So you shouldn't have any trouble citing because all of these examples are actually in your notes. They're also in your Cengage handbook in that little excerpt. There's ways to cite websites, way to cite online magazine articles, way to cite books, way to cite web, tape, web pages. So you should not have any trouble citing these unless you're just not reading the materials that are given to you. So. Um, as always, you can always email me and ask questions, but I will say if it's an answer that I know is in our book or that I know is in that presentation that I made or that I know is in that video and you ask that question, that's going to signal to me that you've not taken the time to look at those materials that I've made for you. And I'm going to tell you to go watch them. <laughs> So um, to save yourself time <laughs> and the email, <laughs> make sure that you've looked at all those materials first. I can't stress to you all enough, 90% of you have already looked at the video, I'm sure, and have looked at the Cengage handbook, looked at the materials. You're all good to go. And so I know this is all hot air blowing over you, but it seems like every semester I have several students that I know just haven't looked at the materials. And if they had, they wouldn't be asking the questions that they are. So I just want to put that out there. <laughs> I'm going to get off my salty soapbox <laughs> and just put that out there to make sure that you look over those materials. But there's only four of these. So they're five points each. This assignment is worth 20 points. So each of these assignments is worth five points. Each of these questions is worth five. So you have a print book, you have a magazine article or an online news article. It could be either one. They're both cited the same. Um, a journal article and a web page. And each of these are worth five. So um, 
just make sure that you do all five, all four of them and that you turn them in by Sunday. So um, all, the, all the materials are here, you just had to put them in the right order. Okay, so it shouldn't be too crazy of an assignment. But those are our two assignments for this week. Um, just the Dropbox and the discussion forum. And, and the MLA review, you should be able to get done very early on in the week. And the discussion forum, hopefully all of you post early enough that everybody can hopefully, I would like for you all to be, have your weekend free, because I know you do trick-or-treating or you do events, things like that. Um, I'd like you to have your weekend free. But um, if not, then the replies and the MLA review are due by Sunday. Your posts in the discussion forum are due by Friday. So uh, we're going to finish off this week talking about the remaining chapters for our drama section. So we're going to go to chapter 29. There's only a few slides left in this presentation, but I want to go to uh, chapter 29. Okay. So chapter 29 is about American drama. And up until this point in theater, um, pretty much from Greek times to Shakespeare's times, there was a big trend of, of plays that were um, performed. And then from Shakespeare on in Western tradition, now I'm not counting Eastern countries. I'm not counting Asia or anywhere on the Pacific side. I'm not counting those. But in Western tradition, um, from Shakespeare's time and on, there was a lot of Victorian era plays that drew from Shakespeare, a lot of um, rehashes of Romeo and Juliet, of Hamlet, of Macbeth, um, plays that were very Victorian-esque in terms of about wealthy people, about kings and queens. It was very, very posh. Lots of plays about the upper class society and how they functioned. It was very Downton Abbey, only we didn't focus on the lower floors. <laughs> it was all about Mary and her problems. Um, and that's kind of one of my biggest issues with Victorian literature is it's, it's very first world problems. It's all very, oh, woe is us. We have all this money and just don't know what to do with it. <laughs> um, and it was kind of fun for the for modern masses to kind of fantasize about the element. I think a lot of us, it's why people follow follow the Kardashians. I don't get why people follow the Kardashians and think they're a big deal, but people do. I mean, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people that follow celebrities. And there's this kind of fantasy about what that life would be like if you know had all this money and you had no obligations and your job was just to be a celebrity. So, so there are people that follow that, and that's kind of something they're really big on. And plays at the time were all about that same kind of subject matter. So in America, <laughs> when the Great Depression rolled through in the 1920s, in the late 1920s to the 30s, um, people were kind of over it. People were struggling. They either didn't have jobs, they didn't have money to go to the theater, they were saving money to survive. It was a really dark and bleak time for a lot of Americans. And when they did save up money and were able to go to the play, the whole idea of following the woes of someone that had enough money to get by, clearly, it kind of rang hollow for a lot of citizens because I just didn't understand why am I paying to go see somebody struggle with their rich problems when I can't feed my kids. So American drama kind of was born out of this desire for audiences to have actual realism in their plays. They wanted characters they could relate to. They didn't want to watch plays about kings and queens. They wanted to watch plays about people like them. And they wanted to see issues that were important to the everyman explored in plays. So this realism in American drama basically ties to ordinary life, like ordinary people struggling with real problems and finding real common ground and solutions and explorations of their identity and, and societal issues and things that the audiences could relate to and identify with. So that's kind of where American drama was born at. Um, this sense of chronological realism, a play is occurring in real time. It's not looking at kings and queens of the past. It's happening right now. And plays like Death of a Salesman, Raisin in the Sun, they all draw upon the reality that um, society wasn't perfect. Death of a Salesman is all about the death of the American dream or basically the unattainability of it. Um, Willie Loman's character in Death of a Salesman 
he wants to have the fancy job, the fancy car, put his kids through a fancy college, have a great wife, and, and have this perfected idea of what life is supposed to be like. And he faces a reality in the play that's basically telling him he's not going to get that. That American dream isn't going to happen for him. And the play is about how he psychologically deals with that setback. And it kind of delves deep into the psyche of someone that's deeply troubled and disturbed because they can't attain something they've built their whole life around attaining. It's a fun time. <laughs> and then Raisin in the Sun, in contrast, is dealing with setbacks that hinder a family's ability to function. Like there were all these Victorian plays about, oh, we have problems, we can't figure out which suitor to marry. I got millions of dollars, but I just can't decide which wealthy lawyer I'm going to end up with. Raising the Sun is about a family that's really struggling to get by. And a monetary setback nearly destroys their family. And it's very real and grounded. And the characters are all realistic portrayals of people you would see in everyday life. Um, and I think that's why audiences gravitated so hard to them and so quickly. Because they could instantly relate with the characters being talked about. So there's that. <laughs> um, American drama, it, it still functions today. It's been going on for nearly 100 years, if you can imagine that the 1920s are, are nearly 100 years um, have passed since then. Um, I mean, next year's 2020, so that will mark the 100th year between the 1920s starting and now. So, and these plays are still, they're still happening. They're still a very important and real genre because we do still have tough times. You know, we don't live in a monarchy. We don't have... You know, we do have a 1% and billionaires and celebrities, but they don't represent the mass, right? Uh, in Chapter 30, we don't have this listed in our assignments, but Chapter 30 is all about comedy. And comedy, <laughs> is, it's different throughout history. Comedy has changed and developed and evolved and regurgitated itself and... It, it, it's consistently in plays, comedy is, but it has a very skewed, um, there's a skewed perception about comedy. I think a lot of people, if you go on Facebook or social media, people will be like, oh, humor is so raunchy nowadays. And I would advise anybody who thinks that modern humor is raunchy to go back and read a Greek play. Because <laughs> there is some raunchiness in a Greek play. There's a lot of phallic imagery. There's a lot of sexual innuendos. There's a total play on words. I mean, some Greek plays were dirty. <laughs> they were not appropriate for family fair of what we would consider in modern times to be that. So comedy has always had a, a darker or a more farcical tone to it. It's just that now in modern times we have labels for it and we can recognize it and call it out for what it is ahead of time. Back then it was just comedy and now we can label it. So the three major labels that we have for this chapter are satire, parody, and farce. And I'm going to go through them one by one in order of operations here. Uh, satire is the most kind of high level humor. Um, satire battles against hypocrisy, callousness, and stinginess. Um, it, it's very dry. It's very critiquing of societal norms. It's very harsh at times. Um, the Coen brothers, they did a movie called Burn After Reading. They also did the show Fargo, if you've ever seen either one of those. Those are satires. They are, they are making fun of something, but in a very serious way that has a very distinct message behind it. Um, parody, on the other hand, is a little bit more down to earth from satire. Parody is distinctive and eccentric. It's very visceral. Um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail can be farcical at times. I'm not going to say that it's not, but it also is making some social commentary too. Like the whole scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail um, about the, the guy that the peasant that's like, well, I didn't vote for you. You're and King Arthur's like, well, I'm your king. You don't vote for kings. And he's like, well, why not? And that that's a parody. That's making fun of the social order in medieval times. Um, Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks borders between um, satire and parody, I believe, because Twin Peaks is more of a satire of the soap opera genre, but it's also a parody as well. There's some more kind of uh, loose humor in there as well. And then Between Two Ferns, if you've ever seen it on Netflix, um, Zach Galifianakis, he, um, he's basically doing a parody of a talk show, Between Two Ferns. And it, it's very over the top and eccentric, but it's not like 
fart humor. <laughs> That's where we get farce from. Farce is typically frowned on by scholars and critics because it's very crude and surface level humor. Um, family Guy is farce. Um, Robot Chicken on Cartoon Network is farce. It's just very obvious. I mean, it's still funny. There's still some Robot Chicken sketches I will genuinely laugh at. The Star Wars ones I will laugh at a lot because I'm a fan of Star Wars and so I get the humor. But they're not deep. There's nothing deep or, or meaningful in that in that humor. It's just all very surface level and just trying to get you to laugh really quickly. Um, I'm, I'd say I am personally more likely to rewatch a parody or a satire because I can get some deeper meaning to it than a farce. But I know some people, they just want that instant laugh and they're like, gotcha, farce knows exactly what it's doing. So yeah, those are the three types of comedy. On your exam for the drama section, you will be asked to name all three of these, describe them, and give an example of them. Um, and you can look up satires on the internet and parodies and farce and find your own examples if you're if you don't want to use the ones that are on this presentation. And then finally we have some extra comedy terms to kind of round out our drama unit. Um, chase of wit is when characters trade quick remarks back and forth. So I always think of when I hear chase of wit, I think of the banter between characters. So like in, in the first Avengers movie when Loki, Tom Hiddleston's character is, on the, is in the tower and he's with Tony Stark's character and he's like, I have an army, and Tony Stark's like, we got a Hulk. That's a chase of wit. Um, Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock and Moriarty's banter back and forth, or Sherlock and Watson's, that is a chase of wit. Just, just quick trade backs of dialogue that's humorous back and forth. Wordplay is not just a song title. <laughs> Wordplay is referring to verbal humor and how you use words in a humorous effect. Um, my, my cousin, she's 12, and puns are kind of some of her favorite, where you just play on iterations of, of words for humorous effect. Um, if, you want to, if you want a distinct example of puns, go watch Batman and Robin for about 10 minutes. Uh, that opening segment where Arnold Schwarzenegger is Mr. Freeze, it, there's so many puns, your head will ring. <laughs> but that, that's a good example of puns, um, where he's, he's like... Um, He's like so cool, but he's made of ice, so it's like, meh. It's, puns are hard to explain, but when you actually see examples of them, you're like, oh, okay, I get what you're saying. Um, stock characters, people um, are expected to laugh at these type of characters. For instance, in Beauty and the Beast, Gaston's sidekick is Le Fou, and Le Fou is French for the fool, so he's supposed to be a humorous clown type of character, and that's a stock character. That's the character that we're all expected to make fun of. Um, whether it's, you know, done tastefully or not. And then finally, there is tragicomedy. Tragicomedy is kind of a mixed genre. We sometimes refer to it as black humor or dark humor, meaning it's kind of, it's, it's funny, but it's also kind of tragic at the same time, too. Um, I, you can find different examples of this. Um, there's definitely a lot of things with dark humor into it. Um, there's a show on Netflix called um, Dead With Me. Uh, it has Kristen Applegate in it, and it's where her um, her husband dies, and so she's kind of going to grief counseling and dealing with it. And it's a comedy. The show's a comedy, but there are some tragic and dramatic elements to it, and I would definitely define that as like a dark humor, like a, like a tragic comedy. It's, it's funny, but there's parts of it that you're like, oh, this is really serious. So those are our terms for these chapters. And that is going to round out our presentations uh, for English 122 Drama Unit. Uh, as I've said before, I'm going to be in and out of my office this coming week because I'm going to be at several high schools, so I won't be present in the mornings uh, for class. But I will be in my office late in the afternoon, and I will always be available via, via email or if you want to call and leave me a voicemail. All right, so I'm going to post our video here in the announcements uh, as soon as I get it loaded on YouTube. And then otherwise, if you have questions, please let me know. So far, everybody's topics and outlines for paper three look great, and I'm really excited about them. So keep those coming. Keep working on your papers. We've only got two assignments this week, so that should give you time to continue working as well. As always, if you have any questions, let me know. But otherwise, I look forward to reading your work. Happy Halloween, everybody, and I'll talk to you all next week. Bye.